title lesson today is Fire in the Church. You know, firstly, you know, I do want to say welcome to Jeffrey's family. Thank you guys so much for joining us this lovely morning. You know they're on fire. They travel all the way from Oxford. And of course, you know, I believe Terence's mom as was in the house. I think she's around. Okay, she went out, but she was here at church service. Amen. Fire. Has it been a fire service so far? Wasn't that welcome on fire? Wasn't the communion by Paula on fire? Wasn't that contribution smoking, blizzarding fire? And what can I say? That singing today was definitely on fire. In case you haven't noticed, there's a fire in the church. Just in case you missed it. Just in case you weren't aware. Just in case you're not glued in. There's a fire in the church. What is fire? Fire is the visible effect of the process of combustion. A combustion of a special type of chemical reaction. That's what fire really is. So fire is literally the visible effect of a chemical reaction. You ask what kind of chemical reaction it is? Well, you need three things for fire to exist. Oxygen, air, and a fuel source. And when these three things come together, they create a visible chemical reaction called fire. When I think about fire and how it's got three different things that are needed for it to burn, I think about the Trinity of Trinity principle, which is found in all areas of life. In the Trinity, of course, in Christianity, you have the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But all things boil down to three things in life, time, space, and matter. And within time, you got the Trinity within time, past, present, and future. And within space, you got trinities in space as well. Length, width, and depth. And in matter, you got trinities as well. Solid, liquid, and gas. God has created life with trinities of trinities. So God and fire are synonymous. If you say, I've got God in me, you better be on fire. If you know you're in a church that has God, it's going to be on fire. Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6. This guy's giving him my government name right there, bro. <laughs> Ever felt roasted by life? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grilled by your boss? Oh, man. Right? Yikes. Burned by bitterness? Ooh. Right? Scorched by the sun? Ooh. And now, believe it or not, guys, you know, prior to me, of course, being an evangelist and a preacher, okay, guys, uh, you know, I was actually a kitchen porter. <laughs> Okay, I was a kitchen porter, you know. Some of you guys thought, hey, I, you know, I got baptized, you know, great, I went to full-time ministry. No, I went to go wash some dishes. <laughs> guys, like, you better learn how to wash dishes before you wash people's hearts right there, okay? That's what you gotta learn to do. And prepare me for marriage. I'm told washing dishes, you know, fires up the sisters right there in marriage. There's a reason why I'm bringing this up. Leviticus 6, check this out. In verse 8, it says, the Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron and his sons this command. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth throughout the night till morning. And the fire must be kept burning on the altar. You guys ever been in a hot kitchen before? I mean like a hot kitchen. You know how it's like in a hot kitchen, right? You're sweating. You smell like food. You're just hot all the time. That's how it was like for the priests. These guys were literally in front of fire every single day. Wow. Wow. What does this teach you? If you're trying to be close to God, you're going to smell like you burnt. You're going to smell like you've been burnt. You're going to sweat trying to be close to God. Because you're going to be hot. You're going to be on fire. And of course, the sons of Aaron over here, right, they, they, they had to keep the fire burning on the altar. Now, we know what altars are, right? 
your place of worship. And this was the place where, and God is giving a command here, guys. He's like, no, no, no. This, this, this is the only regulation to worship me with the altar. He says this. Look at this, verse 10. You guys with me? Yeah. It says in verse 10, the priest shall then put on his linen clothes with linen undergarments next to his body and shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he is to take off these clothes and put on other clothes and carry the ashes outside the camp to the place that is ceremonially clean. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat. You got to burn the fat. You got to burn the fat. That's what you got to do with your fat. Burn it. Burn it. It's biblical to burn your fat. Twelve five reasons for workout. There, there it is, right there. Burn the fat. Right? Are the fellowship offerings on it? The fire must be kept burning on the altar. Guess what? Continuously. It must not go out in the church place. This tells us something. This fire should never go out. You're gonna say something, guys. The 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 altar, the altar hearth, right? You gotta say the altar wasn't just something like this. No, it was elevated. You had to get on steps to do your sacrifice. Then we say worshiping God elevates you. Come on. The reason why you're not being lifted up is because you don't worship God. The reason why you're not being elevated as a disciple is you don't worship God. He says over here that the burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth, hearth rather. And you got to understand something, guys. It says this fire must not go out. Not at all. It's a command. These guys were just literally there every single day, adding wood, adding wood, adding wood. Every day, adding wood. Every day, adding wood. Every day. Guess how long it had to go on? 116 years. 116 years of the fire going on. Not go out. No interruptions to your worship. That's what God is saying over here. Nothing should interrupt you. What interrupts you nowadays? You know when you're on YouTube, we hate interruptions. We hate interruptions. You're on YouTube worshiping that video and that ad comes out of nowhere. Interrupts your worship. Right? Even today, coming to church, you got interrupted by traffic right there. We hate interruptions, but we let a lot of things interrupt our worship of God. God says your fire should not go out. You should always be adding stuff, adding fire, adding fire word. You should be on fire. You can, all you guys should be smelling like fire. Because you're trying to be close to God. That's what they're saying over here, guys. Now, you've got to ask yourself a question. Your altar, of course, is a place of worship. And when a fire dies down, guess what happens? You only have ashes. And I got a question for you today. What's on your altar? Is there fire or is there ashes? What, what, what's on your altar? You know, one of, my, one of my closest friends, a loyal brother, is Johnny Chon. And I love Johnny. I asked Johnny, you know, one time I was like, you know, I asked Johnny, I said, Johnny, what, what, what fires you up? What makes you happy? And I was thinking, you know, maybe oh, a good movie. I was thinking, you know, a vinyl. I was thinking maybe some, you know, heavy rock music. He's like, no, bro. What fires me up is nuggets, my quiet time. I'm like, man. That's all. He, he's so spiritual. I'm like, bro, anything else? Can I, I can't give you nuggets, bro. You, like, the Lord gives you nuggets. That's all he wants. And, you know, I, I look at that heart. I'm like, wow. When, when, when I'm not on fire for God in my worship, I, I, there's a problem. There's an issue. If your altar's full of ashes, there's a problem there. Now, it says here, the altar hoth. Okay, what exactly is that? The Hebrew word for altar hearth over here is Ariel. Now, it's kind of interesting. When I look at this, I'm like, wow, Ariel. And there was something else that was called Ariel in the Bible. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 29. We are Bible church, by the way, in case of those who are visiting. If, if, if anything I say is not in the Bible, blow it away like chaff from the threshing floor in the summer. Just blow it away. But if what I say is in the Bible, well, you best believe God is speaking to you.
It says that the, it says that the, 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 the burnt offering should always remain on the altar hearth. And of course, altar hearth in Hebrew is Ariel. Now check Isaiah 29. Check this out. Let's see who is called Ariel in the Bible. Isaiah 29 verse 1. Woe to you, Ariel, Ariel. The city where David settled. Add year to year and let your cycle of festivals go on. Yet I will besiege Ariel. She'll mourn and lament. She'll be, no, she'll be to me like an altar hearth. Israel was called Ariel. The altar hearth where the burnt offering always had to be was called Ariel. This says that Israel should always be the standard of worship. And sadly here, God says, whoa. Okay, this is not the dance song, whoa. No, it's not that. It's not that. For all the millennials, oh man, whoa. No, it's not that. <laughs> whoa was funeral language. Sadness. So you better be sad. So Israel had stopped becoming the standard of worship. And God's like, man, you better be sad, Israel. Far be it for the church to stop being the standard of worship. I look forward to the day where people will travel from distant lands to come to the Birmingham International Christian Church because we set the standard for worship of God. We set the standard. You know, it's always the Spirit of God. I, 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 I want to share with a particular brother, a son of faith, Ebenezer. Ebenezer. Eb stole my fire by sharing about his life because I'm going to share about his life today. But he's on fire, in case you haven't noticed. Eb needed D time every single day. Every day. I'm going I'm I'm to be laying around. He needed D time every single day. Eb wouldn't come to church sometimes. We had to go resurrect him uh, and restore him in uh, Wolverhampton. We had to travel all the way to Wolverhampton. I mean, that's serious. This is Ebenezer, right? Needed D time every single day. He wouldn't come to church. We had to go travel after church service on a Sunday, go to Wolverhampton. We stand outside his building, his house. He doesn't want to come outside. We wait there for a couple of hours. We're like, Ebs, come outside. We're waiting. We call him. He doesn't pick up. Sister finally comes out. Oh, you're looking for Ebenezer? We're like, yes, we are. Ebs, your friends are here. Finally comes down, beard messed up, no trim, super depressed. He's like, I don't want to become a disciple. I want to fall away. That was Ebenezer. Got tested in the kingdom of God. One of his best friends fell away. All his best friends studied the Bible up to come the cross and said, I don't want to become a disciple. His mom almost went to jail. He, he had his, you know, he, he, his pharmacy degree, he had to, you know, change that. He had no job. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know what to do. I want to leave the kingdom of God. But Ebbs is now on fire. He's, got, he's making more money than some of us here in the church. He's going to GLC. He's leading the live Bible talk. He is fruitful. He, this guy's on fire. He's on fire. I'm just saying, man, you know, sisters, you better hurry up, man. Let's go back to Leviticus right there. I'm just, I don't know, man. Some sisters, when I, I'm hearing words. I'm just hearing things. A bunch of birds whispering around, hearing Ebenezer's name. Let's go back to Leviticus, guys. Leviticus 6. Check this out. Now, what I love about Ebenezer, of course, his name means stone of help. And I believe that Ebenezer will be a great help in building the Birmingham church when I leave. I sincerely believe that. Leviticus 6. The point, of course, of bringing Ebenezer's story is that he stayed faithful. Yes. Stay faithful, guys. Right. Stay faithful. Right. Leviticus 6. Now check this out. You guys there? Yeah. It says, in verse 10, how should he come to the worship? The priest shall then put on his linen clothes with linen under garments next to his body. He says, don't come, to the, uh, don't come worship me nude. That's what God said. Don't come and worship me naked. Wear your underwear. That's what, I'm serious. Modern day terms, young man, get your hand out of your pants, your trousers. Young lady, cover up. If you're not advertising anything, close it. Cover. Cover yourself. There's a story of a lady, right, on the train. She's on the train. There's another guy, of course, uh, uh, opposite her. And she noticed, of course, the guy is looking at her. And he's like, man, this guy's looking at me. This is, okay, this is weird. 
right? Okay, she ignores him, right? That's how it is nowadays. You know, you look at okay, you know each other, right? And th so the, the whole entire journey, the guy keeps looking. The guy keeps looking. And she's like, okay, this guy's a bit strange. Right? And he's like, hey, dude, you keep looking at me. He's like, yeah, I know. I'm like, okay. Um, so she's like, okay, it's a bit weird. So she gets off the train, and the guy gets up as well. Now, of course, she's, she's staying at a hotel, a nearby hotel, as to close to the, the train station. She gets to the hotel. She realizes, okay, he is also in the hotel, too. And then, of course, she's about to go to her room. And, you know, right down there by the lobby, the guy says, I will give you a million bucks if you sleep with me tonight. A million bucks. The lady's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm married. He's like, I know. But I'll give you a million bucks right now tonight if you sleep with me tonight. The lady, of course, thinks about it. says, okay, I'll do it. And they go up the elevator. They go up the elevator. And when they go up the elevator, of course, you know, there's a big party and stuff like that. And as they're going along, he starts bargaining with her. He says, okay, you know, how about half a grand, half, 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 half a million? And she's like, no, 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 no. What do you think I am? You think I'm a prostitute? It's like, well, we established that the moment you said yes to sleeping with me tonight. I was just trying to determine your price. Sister, still want to fall away for that man in the world? Still want to fall away for that man in the world? Yeah, Janelle's like, I ain't got one. That's it. I'm, I'm fixing the kingdom of God. How about it, brothers? Will you, let a woman, will you let a woman outside the kingdom take you out? Would you? Let me tell you something right now. If you let a woman lead you out of the kingdom of God, you're going to have a horrible marriage. Horrible, because she's leading you. And men are to lead. Now, why does God tell the, the, the priest here to, to wear undergarments or, or be pure? Because at this time, pagan worship required nudity. When you worship pagan gods, you have to be naked. You understand? At this time, if you wanted to watch porn and stuff like that, you had to go to the temple of uh, Ashtoreth uh, and Baal. It was a bit different. Nowadays, we've got mobile temples now. They're all online. They're called Tinder, Instagram, Snapchat, right? Clubs, nightclubs. That's what they call nowadays, right? You've got temples on wheels, temples on the go. That's how it is nowadays. All temples are now online. So you, you, you might think, oh, no, I'm not worshiping Baal. I'm not worshiping Ashtoreth. No, you are. It's in your pocket. You just go online. You go to worship. You worship that God. Preach. Sexual immorality is paganism. Preach. It's paganism. Right. Having sex before marriage is paganism. Preach. God's like, you got to be pure. Right. If you're trying to come to the altar right there. Wow. You guys with me? Yes. Let me catch my notes right there. Here it is. Now... What I like about this fire, there was a key thing about this fire, is that what they would do is, from the beginning of time, when it started, God ignited the fire. They all they had to do was just put the sacrifice, and they had to wait for God to light the fire. And once God lit the fire and got the fire going, he says, it must not go out. So if God is starting a fire in the Birmingham church, you better, you don't let it go out. Amen. Don't let it go out. Don't let the fire go out when you go to the GLC. Don't let the fire die when I go to Amsterdam. Don't let the fire die when we have new leaders taking over and raising up. Don't let the fire die. I got a question for the church. Why are there no guys named William serving in the army? They dislike the phrase fire at will. Fire at will. Fire at will. Fire at will. On a real talk, though, I really got a question for the church. What is your flashpoint? What's your flashpoint? Some of you guys are like, what is that, bro? Flashpoint, bro. Okay, flashpoint. The flashpoint is the lowest temperature at which the application of ignition causes the vapors above the liquid to ignite. So it's just the lowest temperature. Okay, what is the lowest thing in life that can start your fire? That's a flashpoint. What, what is it? What, what, what is the simplest thing that could just get your fire going, right? For me, you know, it's a text message from my fiance, Janae. You know, when I get a text message, get, I'm in the flashpoint right there. I'm in the flashpoint. But after flashpoint, you have what is called the flame point. This is the temperature that will sustain your fire. Sustain your fire. So you got to know what starts your fire, but you got to know what sustains your fire. You got to know that. You got to know the difference. See, now, of course, my fiance, hey, flashpoint, but she doesn't, she doesn't sustain my fire. 
God sustains my fire. He sustains my fire. And you got to ask yourself right now, okay, what is, it, what, is, what is the smallest thing right now that could get you on fire? But of course, we know that God is your flame point. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Speaking of flame points and God being a flame point, Deuteronomy 4, right? Don't fall asleep on me right there. Deuteronomy 4. Check this out. In Deuteronomy 4, it says in verse 20. Say amen when you guys are there. Amen. Come on, let's go. Church is on it. Come on. Verse 20 says, but as for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace, out of Egypt. God says your old life was like an iron smelting furnace. It, it, it was, do you believe that your old life was a hot mess? Do you believe that right now? It was a hot mess. Am I wrong? It was a serious hot mess. I'm serious. I was a hot mess. My father abandoned me when I was at the age of five. I was, you know, sexually abused by a close family friend at the age of five for months running. I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it was sexual abuse until two years ago. I didn't even know it was, I didn't know. I was like, oh, it just happened. No, sexual abuse. Like, oh, no. Exposed to pornography at the age of seven for the first time. I, I, I tried homosexual things at the age of 10, 12. Heavy porn and masturbation addicts from 10 to, uh, from not 10, but 16 to 19. I hated my dad because he abandoned me. I, a lot of times I'll say, oh, no, you know, he just left, he just left. And then, no, one day it hit me, no, he abandoned me. He knows where I am. He says, I don't want to be there. Abandonment. I cried. Man, broke my heart. That was maybe before being a disciple. And I had to forgive him. I had to forgive him. And I became a disciple. Do you believe that your old life was a hot mess? God's like, he's reminding the people, he's like, hey, guys, I, I took you out of the iron smelting furnace. That, that's, that, that was out of Egypt. That was your old life. It was Egypt. It was a hot mess. It says, he called you out of that to be a people of his inheritance, as you now are. The Lord was angry with me because of you. And he suddenly swore that I will not cross the Jordan and enter the good land the Lord your God has given you as inheritance. I hope you guys are still ready to cross the Jordan. Amen. Okay, we spoke about that one last week, right? Crossing over the Jordan. Yeah. It says, God is angry you don't want to cross the Jordan. We're going to cross the Jordan, guys. Verse 22, it says, I will die in this land. <laughs> I will not cross the Jordan. <laughs> But you are about to cross over and take possession of that good land. Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Don't make for yourself an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. Verse 24. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. A jealous God. You know, other translations say a devouring fire. Consume. Consume means to take everything up, suck everything up. This says God is a consuming fire. He wants to consume everything in your life. Wow. He wants to consume your heart right now. Yeah. All of it. He wants to consume your mind. Yeah. He wants to consume your love life. Yeah. Tell you who to date and marry. Yeah. We live in a time where, you know, hey, uh, you know, hey, I, I like this preference, right? Right? You remember my story last time, okay? I had a skin preference, but it was a sin preference. That's what it was. <laughs> okay? That's how we are nowadays. Some people, sadly, literally, some people come to church like, woo, it's too international here. You're going to ruin the bloodline of the family uh, in terms of, like, skin color and leave the church. That's what some people are, literally. God wants to consume your love life, tell you who to date and marry, who's going to get you to heaven. Not who you like. No, who's going to get you to heaven? He wants to consume your finances, your wallet. He wants to consume it all. Take your money. He wants to take your money right there. That's God. He wants to consume your finances. GLC, take it all. Consume it. Right? And he says he's a jealous God. Now remember, God is good. That means everything he does is good. See, his jealousy is a good jealousy. Right? Jealousy over here is he doesn't want you flirting with other gods. It's like, well, don't, don't play around other gods. No, you're mine. It's like, I don't, I don't want you to be worshiping other gods. I'm jealous of you. Because he loves you so much. He's je so his, his jealousy is good. Ours is sinful. Yeah. Our jealousy is sinful. You know, why is he talking to her? Why, why is he talking to her? Why is he laughing like that? She's not that funny. What's going on? That's our jealousy, sinful jealousy. God is totally different. The contemporary English version says of verse 24, the Lord will be angry if you worship other gods. And it can be like a fire destroying everything in its path. 
My first point is simply, where there's a fire, there's an emergency. Where there's a fire, there's an emergency. When I think about great fires, I think about the great fire of Rome. It occurred in about 64 AD in July. Now the fire began, in a, people, you know, of course, they, they talk about the story, they say the fire began in a, in a merchant store, right, uh, in a stadium, okay? The stadium was called uh, the Circus Maximus. And this happened on the night of 19 July. This fire went on for so long, literally, they say it went on for about six days. Wow. It went on for so long in Rome at this time that at the end of the fire, they said about literally 70% of Rome was burned. And everyone was like, man, where was Emperor Nero at this time? And Emperor Nero at this time, he said, ooh, I've got a perfect, I, I know who to blame. I'm going to blame the cult. Literally, it was called a cult, the Christians. And what happened was that when this fire occurred, he then blamed the Christians. And then this literally began the heaviest persecution in Christianity named right now. That fire. I look at him like, wow, fire initiated persecution. What did we learn? Fire initiates. How do we know our disciples on fire? They initiate. They initiate in asking people on dates. They initiate on evangelism. They initiate in setting up Bible studies. They initiate. That's how you know a disciples on fire. You know you're on fire. You put you in a cage, you melt the bars. You melt the bars. We put you in a cage, you just melt it. That's why you, you know you're on fire as a disciple. Now, of course, they look at this and they said, man, what, 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 what made, uh, what, what, what was, why, why, why the fire? How did it begin? They said, of course, Emperor Nero may have had impure motives. Emperor Nero, he, he wanted to, in a, in, a, in a way, rebuild his empire. But in rebuilding his empire, he was playing with fire. And he got hurt. That's what happens. If you play around with fire, you're going to get hurt. When I was a kid, I used to, you know, walk to my bus stop, right? I grew up in South Africa in the hood, okay? Uh, and, you know, so I, I you know, I, I used to walk to this uh, bus stop. And, you know, one day I'm walking to my bus stop, and, you know, I see a lot of people crowding. I was like, man, what's going on? Why, why is everyone at this bus stop, right? And everyone's just looking up at this building. I'm like, what's going on over here, right? And as I, because I'm walking towards it, there's a building, and as I turn the corner, a building is on fire. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I've never seen a fire like this before. Everyone's just crawling around. There's a building on fire. It's on fire. Almost like Grenfell Tower, right? It was on fire. And I'm, I'm looking, and there's a guy who's inside, all the way up at the top. I'm like, oh my goodness. The guy's like, he's looking outside. He's like, oh my goodness, it's a fire. It's burning. The house is burning. He looks down. He looks back. He's like, I have no option but to jump. And it was pretty high, very high. At the bottom, of course, was wooden planks and everything. And you know, it, it wasn't like in America. In America, of course, you know, you got those pumps, you know, then you jump on the trampoline, it's awesome, right? No, not in South Africa. In South Africa, you die if you, if you don't do it well. And the guy, literally, everyone's like, you have no choice but to jump. The guy looks back. He goes, disappears for a bit, comes back, is like, there's no other way. And literally, he jumped. He jumped out of the building, literally about five to six stories high, jumped out, bang, fell on the floor, survived, went out limping, hit a glass on his head, I remember it vividly to this day, went out limping, and I was like, wow, fire can make you desperate, it can make you desperate, some of you guys aren't desperate enough because your house isn't burning up. How about you just jump out, jump out the building, and jump into the waters of baptism? You know, today we got two men who are jumping out of the house of fire into the waters of baptism. One, of course, is Terrence. You know, Terrence is such an incredible man. He was reached out to by Wellington. Another disciples on fire. Now, I, I, I got to be honest. I didn't take, you know, Terrence very serious in the beginning. You know, I was, they told me, okay, Terrence is studying the Bible. Okay, man, cool, cool, cool. I seen progressing in the Bible studies. I'm like, okay, okay, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's, let's test. Let's, let's, let's see if he really believes. And, of course, we, we, we take over the studies and we test him. We're like, oh, whoa, whoa, okay, he believes. Wow. Okay, he gets it. Now, of course, what happens is we have the kind of cost study yesterday. So we go to his house. And, you know, I say, Terrence. 
are you willing to give up everything? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm willing to give up everything. I'm like, no, 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 Terrence. You're a father right now. It's got a little, you know, little, little cute boy called Elijah, two years old. And I said, Terrence, what if God calls you to go back to Jamaica on a mission team, but part of that is you're going to be split from your son? And he looked at us, he's like, no. I was like, this is tense. What do I do? And I was like, I was like you know what, Terrence? God can relate. He had to give up his son to save the whole entire world. And at that moment, Terrence broke down and cried. Cried. And I told him, I said, Terrence, you're a good man. You, you're a man that loves his son. And he wrestled for minutes. Literally, he was crying, 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 wrestling. Trying to, and I was like, man, you know, I wish we had more. I wish we had more men. I wish we had more men like you. I wish to die for the tons. And I was like, wow. He's like, no. He was honest. Like, no. I, I don't, it's hard. I'm like, I know it is. But he, he went through it. He wrestled through it. And, you know, it was quite funny. Elijah's just there in the middle. It's just like, <laughs> why is all these guys so serious? <laughs> no, thanks, brother. And, but he's doing it. And today he's come to get baptized. <laughs> Not only him, he's got a twin today. Jeffrey's getting baptized. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Hang on, Jeffrey, long enough, you'll be dying of laughter. This dude is hilarious. I'm being dead serious. This guy, is, he's just, you know, just, he's funny. But jokes aside, he, he's a uh, BCU student, right? And studying mechanical engineering. Smart guy. And what I love about Terrence is, uh, sorry, Jeffrey. I love Terrence as well, don't get me wrong. What I love about Jeffrey is that, you know, I, I, when we're in his Bible studies, his light and darkness study, his confession, his sinless was a movie. I'm being, I'm not lying. It was a movie. I was like, okay, Stranger Things 2 is kind of awesome, but this is, this is, I, I'll take this any day. His sinless was, man, all the brothers were just there like, whoa. I said, I'm like eight years into faith, guys, almost eight years, and I, I, I've heard a lot of sin, but man. Then I was like, how old are you again? 19. I'm like, <laughs> almost died three times. Three times. And in and, and one, uh, one of those times we almost died, he prayed. He said, God, help me. And I believe God heard his prayer. And he sent Ebenezer on his path. And Jeffrey has come to get baptized today. He's brought his family, brought his friends out. This guy's a leader. Fire makes you desperate. Yeah. These men believed that their sinful life was burning and they had to jump out of that house. Unless you believe your life right now is burning up, you're not going to jump out of the house. You'll stay inside. And you know what happens when you stay inside? You know what actually kills people? It's not the fire, it's the smoke. They say what actually happens when fire happens, right? When, fire, when a place is burning up, right? The smoke knocks you out. And the fire consumes you and you die. So you stay around that house long enough. Oh, maybe you're not burning. No, don't worry about that. The smoke will knock you out. It will, you, you get knocked out by the smoke one day and the fire will burn you up. Question is, are you saved today? Are you saved? What is saved? Saved means the wrath of God. The fire wrath of God is taken away from you. That's what salvation means. It means that if you're in sin right now, God is mad at you. I'm sorry, he's mad at you. And to be saved means you, you, God isn't mad at you anymore. Yeah. That on judgment day, instead of him judging you, he's like, oh, come in, you're going to go to heaven. But if there's sin and you're not saved, right, you're going to be judged and go to hell. Are you confident if you died right now, you'll go to heaven? Woo. Are you confident? Do you have full confidence right now that if you died, drop dead here, you go to heaven? If not, there's hesitation, your heart is pounding right now, like mine a couple of years, nine years ago, study the Bible with us. Come on, study the Bible and get baptized. Get saved. You know, I spoke to a, a lady who came today. She's like, man, you know, Orisha invited me. I've not been baptized. I'm going to do it quickly. And that's her right there. She wants to get baptized. Yeah. You better study the Bible with that girl. She wants to get baptized. Yeah. I'm sorry for calling you out. 
Daniel chapter 3, guys. Hang in there, guys. We're almost there. Jump out the building and into the waters of baptism. Daniel chapter 3. Second point is simply faith in the fiery furnace. Faith in the fiery furnace. In Daniel 3, read over here in verse 4. Now, what happened before this, right? We know Daniel 2. Uh, 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 Daniel has a, well, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of a statue, an awesome, huge, massive statue. And a statue has various uh, earthly minerals, right? The head of gold, uh, the chest and arms of silver, the billion thighs of bronze, and the legs of iron and clay. And, of course, what happens, Daniel interprets the dream. He says, no, no, no. But, you know, the, the first part is Babylon. The second part is the Medo-Persians, right? Because the Persians and the Medes formed an alliance together and they destroyed Babylon. And then after that is the Greeks. The Greeks were the ones who destroyed Persia. Uh, you know, we saw that in 300, the movie 300, right? And, of course, what destroyed the Greeks were the Romans, right? So he tells them, hey, that's what's going to happen. This is what this statue represents. Now the king, he's like, no, I'm going to make one just full gold. I don't care about what God tells me. I don't care about what the prophecy means. I'm going to make a statue made of, few gold, uh, of gold over here, right? Now, this is what he says. So, give you a little backdrop before we read verse 4 of Daniel chapter 3. You guys there? Yeah. Sure, it says, Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn. I believe Nebuchadnezzar liked reggae music. This was the, you know, this is, this is a horn. That's what it was. You know, I, he liked reggae. That's what I believe. Nebuchadnezzar liked reggae music, right? It says, you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music. You must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever doesn't fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. This says that some music will send you to hell. Literally, some music you listen to will send you to hell. Right? How do we know this? Saul, when Saul was tormented by evil spirit, he had to listen to spiritual music to get better. And I'm like, wow, maybe that's, that's the issue. The reason why you're not spiritual is because you don't listen to spiritual music. Oh, man, I'm struggling with my thoughts. Okay, what are you listening to? Wild thoughts. Bro, it's in the name. It's in the name. Why you listen to a song? It's telling you right there. Right? It's in the name of having all these thoughts, bro. Right? Verse 8 says, At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They say to the king of Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whatever and whoever doesn't fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews who, have, who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. That what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar. King, we, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But if he does not... We want you to know, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Man, such confidence. Woo! Woo! Confidence. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors. Uh, oh, sorry, before that, I just skip, skip a whole chapter over here, right? Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his, ha- his attitude towards them changed. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. And commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw in the, in the fire? 
They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shot a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, son of the Most High God. Come out, come, come here. Come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, uh, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was the hair of their heads sinked. Uh, sinked. Their, robed, their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and, de uh, and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses burnt into piles of rubble. For no other god can save in this way. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Isn't that a cranking story? What does the image of gold symbolize? I'll be very quick with this one, okay? All those clock watches. <laughs> the image of gold symbolizes world religions. The image of gold is what the government believes and teaches. Because he got, he got all the officials over here. Let's get all these officials. Let's get, let's get them all together. That's the image of gold. The image of gold represents everything that's against God. Because God said, no, there's not going to be a whole... Uh, instead of gold, it's going to be different materials. Like, no, I don't care. No, I'm going against your command, God. That's what the image of gold represents. The image of gold represents conformity. Conforming to what is popular. Because at that time, if you weren't worshipping this idol, you weren't popular. The image of gold represents conformity. The image of gold represents state religions. Just because you're born in a particular state or a nation doesn't mean that's the religion you've got to believe in. The image of gold was a religious scare tactic, almost like some churches today. If you don't worship this idol, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. Scare tactics to get people to worship. Lastly, the image of gold was man-made. And you know what they say about the image of gold? Because it was, it was, quite, it was like a large, uh, it was a large statue. So they say it was a lot of money for you to produce a whole large statue of gold like that. So what they say is that literally at that time, the custom was actually to produce a wooden statue, but covered in gold. And that's false teaching in religions. Looks expensive on the outside, but cheap on the inside. And we know how wood is the perfect fuel source for fire. Your false religion is the perfect fuel source for the fires of hell. Straight. Perfect fuel source for you to go straight to hell. That's what the image of gold represents. It was a cheap religion. It was a cheap religion made to look expensive. That's what the image of gold represents over here. I want to let you know, of course, just in short, all denominations, all denominations are man-made. They're all man-made. If you want to know what the histories are, talk to me after this fellowship. We'll tell you the history. All, all, all denominations are man-made. All of them. And if, in the, if, if an individual isn't made into a true disciple, according to Matthew 28, baptized to get their sins forgiven, they're not saved. Yeah. They're not saved. You are worshiping the image of gold. Yeah. You're conforming to what the society has set the standard when it comes to worship. Right. But we see over here that the fiery furnace takes a lot of faith. I want to let you know that if you're studying the Bible right now, you're choosing the fiery furnace. It takes great faith to become a true disciple, a true Christian. And the reason why people don't want to become true Christians is because, yeah, it's a fiery furnace. It takes great faith. Being a disciple isn't easy work. Revelation 21. Come on, bro. Bring it for a close. This is the last one. Revelation 21. A sub point here is that the fires of hell are a reality. Let's see, let's, see what, who, let's see who goes to hell. Let's find out. And it, it's kind of nice you know, to know who's going and who's not going to go. I needed that. I won't lie to you. I went to church my whole life. I didn't know if I was going to go to hell or heaven. I didn't know. I wish someone could tell me, hey, dude, this lifestyle gets you to hell. This lifestyle gets you to heaven. I wish I knew that, right? Let's find out. Okay? And if you're one of these individuals, you know you're going to hell. Check this out. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the cowardly. There it is. Cowards go to hell. 
they don't have the bravery to become a true Christian. You're a coward. You're a chicken. They go to hell. So the Bible says, coward. Okay, now the coward, let's say you're not a coward. Let's say you're brave. Well, I'm brave. I'm not a coward. Okay, man. Let's see. The unbelieving. Woo. If you don't believe in God, you're going to hell. Simple. <laughs> we show you the truth of Christianity. You don't believe, you're going to hell. The vile. The word vile here means you, <laughs> you're a morally um, bad person. <laughs> Bad people go to hell. <laughs> okay? Bad people go to hell. The murderers. Now, we know Jesus Christ kind of extended this to a next level. He said, if you have bitterness or anger, unforgiveness, you murder your brother. Yeah. Send you to hell. Murder. The sexually immoral. Pretty straightforward. Sexual immorality comes in various forms. Right? What's the law when it comes to sex with God? You're a man and a woman and you're married. That's it. Done. Period. Simple. Any sex outside of that is sexually immoral. It'll take you to hell. Homosexuality will take you to hell. Uh, lesbianism will take you to hell. Bestiality will take you to hell. Necrophilia, sex with dead people, will take you to hell. Uh, pedophilia will take you to hell. Even though the government will tell you that it's a mental health condition, no, it's not. It's a sin. It's a sin. It will take you to hell. Rape is sexual abuse, uh, sexual immorality. It will take you to hell. Adultery will take you to hell. Okay? It's getting quiet right there. Who is it? Those who practice magic arts. Right? Tarot card reading, palm reading, star signs, horoscope, all, all that stuff. Right? I'm a Gemini. Okay, I'm a Cancer. All right. Let's see if that Cancer will help you on Judgment Day. Right? The idolaters. Idolatry is putting anything above God. If anything dictates your feelings, emotions, your joy, other than God, that's an idol. Your phone is an idol. Your life can be an idol. A relationship can be an idol. Some of you don't want to become disciples because of their relationships. Your family can be an idol. Your job can be an idol. Some of you are not at church today because they're at work. Idol, idolatry. Right? And all liars. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I don't think that was a coincidence. Let's see what happens to these people. They'll be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now, I hate to be that preacher, guys, but, you know, I got to be that preacher. Far be for me to be a preacher where you leave today feeling all comfortable and happy. But we've got, we got, we got to speak the truth. And we only speak the truth in love. You know what I mean? Hell is a place that wasn't designed for people, guys. It was not at all. If you're wondering today, like, man, why is God so... You know, you know, why are you sending us to hell? No, he doesn't want to. The Bible says he doesn't want. The Bible says literally in Ezekiel, he, he, he cries. He cries at people going to hell and dying, not being saved. He cries. First Timothy 2, 3 to 4 says he wants all people to come to knowledge of the truth and be saved. He wants that. That's his deepest desire. If you're here today, he wants you to be saved. That's his deepest desire. Now, some say, hey, why doesn't God end all evil? Well, if he ends all evil, he has to destroy a lot of people as well. That's the, re that's the reality. So the Bible says he is patient, waiting for you to repent. That's why he hasn't end the world. He's patient. He's waiting. It's like I'm waiting for you to repent and become a disciple. Now, why is hell eternal? Because, hell, because evil has to be eradicated forever. That's why it's eternal. And it, it says in Matthew 25, it was created for Satan and his demons. So it wasn't created for you. But at the same time, we have a loving God. He gives you free will. What is free will? Free will isn't free will if you don't have the option to disobey. You know, I would rack my brain for years. Like, man, why did God put the, the, the tree in the, in the garden? You know, Adam? Well, I was, I, went, I was ticked off. It, it hurt my faith. And I went deep in my Bible. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Free will. It's not free will if every command is just good you got to have the option to go against God. That's free will. Because you're like, okay, this is what God wants, but I have the option to go there too. That's free will. That's why he allowed the tree to be created. Free will. To test the free will of mankind. So it's not like God made mistakes. No. 
Free will is because you, you, you got to be given the option to disobey. In closing, fire can be good or bad. Fire can be good or bad. God is referred as fire a lot of times in the Bible. Fire represents the presence of God, right? Fire can also represent, uh, yeah, his presence. And fire can also represent testing and trials. You know, it says, hey, you could be baptized in fire, <laughs> right? That happened to a lot of us. We got baptized in water, and then after a few weeks, we got baptized in fire, <laughs> right? We get tested, okay? Fire. And he uses fire to test your faith. You know, I want you to leave tonight knowing that God is a consuming fire. What, okay, what, okay, what message to, to, to distill everything I've said? What, what, what to do? Well, if you are not a true Christian, become a true Christian. Yeah. That's, that's, that's it. Become a true Christian. Um, and if you're a disciple, right, if you're a disciple, be on fire. Yeah. Rebuild that altar again. Get that altar on fire again. Be committed. Be fully committed again. Right? Save someone else. Snatch someone else from the fires of hell. Snatch someone. Be fruitful. Baptize someone. I love you, and to God be all the glory.